Okay, folks, I've been waiting here for the last 10, 15, 20 minutes. Some people are going to die. Now's the time. Pay your attention, please. Pay your attention, please. I know some of you have been waiting 5, 10, 20, some an hour. Some even came earlier than that to get a seat. So we're going to make it worth your while. The Pacific Pinball Museum is proud to present Jersey Jack. Hey, that's really great. Thank you, everybody. Um, let me get over here. Well, maybe not. How's everybody? Yeah. Good, good, good. Wow, what a great. Wow, wow, it's really, really great. Thanks everybody for coming to see um, uh, what's going on right now with us, with our company, with our game. It's really exciting, it's a really exciting day for me personally, and I know a lot of you in the room that actually order games. Um, a year ago, just about to the day, I think it was yesterday, a year ago yesterday, I stood in this room, but I think it was set up differently. I might have been over there on the seats with this way. Next I kind of remember. It was the room over. Oh, it was the room over, okay. So I remember my big reveal last year was opening up a tube, uh, a cardboard tube, and unrolling like cabinet graphics um, to what could be, might be, maybe not be, you know, some kind of thing that um, we were going to make. You know, so this year I actually have the happy uh, pleasure. <laughs> and this, this thing wasn't really my idea. I was just going to roll it in, and some of the guys said, no, nah, we'll put it under something. We'll make it a little dramatic. Uh, some of the rich guys wanted to get like a fog machine and a big curtain. <laughs> uh, you know, I said, you know, donate that money to the museum because they're trying to get a hold of it. This morning, I made a donation, uh, you know, uh, to the museum. And if you guys can get to $50,000, by your goal, I donated $1,000 this morning, all right? So if you guys can get to, uh, let's say, 50 grand by the end of that campaign, I'm giving you one of these games that you can auction off. Anybody that's ever actually plunged the silver ball onto a play field anywhere at any time in their life, they should be interested in supporting, preserving, continuing, growing, building, anything, anywhere that promotes pinball. Whether that's electronic, whether it's on an iPhone, whether it's anywhere. It's all good. It's games. It's pinball. Look, we get to make games. What a wonderful thing we get to do. You know, we get all kinds of things going on in our lives. So let's... Um, Let's start at the beginning of this. Let's just somebody uh, that's tall just go over and you do it. Pull that. Yeah, there you go. There's the guy. <laughs> I'm trying to break my topper. You know. That's why you need a tall, tall guy. You guys. Uh... Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that was good for you, but that was good for me. <laughs> That was a lot better than me opening that tube last year and rolling out those uh, graphics. By the way, I don't think Rick Bartlett is here, is he? Rick, where's Rick? Rick, uh, Rick's, Rick printed those for me last year because we didn't even know how to print graphics, how backwards we were. And um, I proceeded to leave here at the show, go to Scomas and have my favorite Dungeons Crab, go to the airport, leave the rental car, and when I got to the gate, I realized I left the tube with the graphics in the, in the car. Oh. So that 500 bucks I gave Rick was a donation, and somebody, they wound up at a dumpster somewhere, because I never sold them on eBay for sale, because that would have been kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, that's like somebody stole your tickets to Yankee Stadium, and you go find a guy in the seat, hey, by the way, those are my tickets. What are you doing? Yeah. So first, you know, what I'd like to say is I'd like to thank um, all the people that invited me here, Ron Chan, uh, you know, amazing, all of the volunteers, uh, Michael. So, Michael, Scheiss, and, uh, you know, everybody, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, Mr. Miller, you know, and all, all the people that are involved. And uh, it's really an honor and a privilege for me to be here at all, uh, to be able to stand here. I almost, um, I almost was not able to be here today. And it was, uh, it was like, a, I had to really agonize over whether I was going to come here or I was going to get my iPhone 5. <laughs> and you know, when it comes to Apple devices, you know I'm an Apple person, it's over 700 bucks a share, go out and buy Apple. I told you guys last year it was three and change. Who bought it, bought it, who bought it, probably bought one of these games, and who didn't buy it, probably figured we weren't going to build a game. So, you know, but, uh, you know, pinball wins out it over an Apple device for me anyway. So, uh, it, was, uh, it was a pretty cool thing. Um, you know, conventional wisdom is something that guides a lot of us in our lives. Um, and conventional wisdom would probably say, uh, you don't bring a product like this uh, to a show like this with pinball people like us, that's really not complete. Because there's a lot of danger in that. You know, there's only one chance to make a first impression. And then, you know, um, things aren't complete on it. This is not the game you're gonna get that comes to your house and the rules aren't done. Welcome, come on in. Uh, you know, and, and those kind of things, and we'll go through it, and it's no excuses, because I never want to make an excuse, I want to explain. Um, so, you know, conventional wisdom says those things in product development, let's say, not just in pinball, but, you know, if I subscribe to conventional wisdom, I wouldn't start a pinball company. <laughs> so, um, how we did it, it's only because of our customers that believe in, I guess, first me, and then the other members of the team, and then in what we were doing, and as we built that community, and you know, we had the crazy Google group with more than 700 people on the group writing, wow, some interesting, crazy, cool things. Uh, uh, and people say to me, how do you read that? How do you deal with that? What, what you know, these people say this stuff, and I, I love it all. Uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, do I go to the other groups and read some of what they put on that? Sometimes yeah, sometimes no. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. I respect that. And so, you know, um, we stand here with a game that we're going to roll um, across the, actually we're going to carry it across the bridge, uh, so like everything doesn't fall off of it, not that it would. This game yesterday, uh, for those that were here when it arrived, um, we flew it across the country because we didn't ship it until Tuesday and we were playing around with it. It could have gone Monday and missed the pickup, so we had to fly it over here, so it took a, a flight. And it went in the box that was a box we kind of rejected. We're not using that box, but okay, we put it in that box. And uh, it was definitely dropped because the, the pallet was on top of the game and splinters. I think, uh, you know, Martin was there, he took pictures, and the side of the box was open. And we opened it, and there were no bumps and bruises on the game. So I thought that was a pretty cool test another drop test that we really didn't plan. <laughs> and I think um, it would have got another drop test if not for a few of you that were here when it arrived on the truck yesterday and the guy was pushing it off the lift gate, not knowing that was the end of the truck and he was still going with it. So uh, I don't know if he likes pinball, maybe he's a video game guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> we don't know, he's a, he's a video game guy, I think, you know, so whatever. Um, I think we're gonna go through the game a little bit um, and show you some things. And then, really, honestly, uh, I'm just going to take some questions from everybody because I'm tired of talking about the game, uh, in a way. Uh, you know, I want the game to do its own talking. I want you to uh, play it, uh, to get to know it a little bit. It's, it's the very beginning of what it's going to be. You know, next month, probably a little less than a month, well, about a month from today, we're at Pinball Expo. So, you know, more stuff will be on this game. There's a couple more design elements that are getting added to it that are almost uh, there. Uh, Keith, of course, is programming away because unlike uh, program pinball that he did before, on this game, what you have is uh, about 150 RGB LEDs. So that's red, green, blue LEDs. And we actually use the most expensive uh, LED that we could find. And we drive it uh, downward. So it's not driven at a height, it's driven at a, at a low. Uh, because, you know, uh, anybody that put LEDs in your games, you know, you get sunspots and you can't even see the ball and everything like that. So when you play this, we want you to certainly see the ball because that's an important element to playing pinball, not just that we're going to look at this. So, you know, Keith has, um, I don't know, 
billion colors or so, they tell me that he can program every different light to be every different thing and every different show. All the inserts on the game are clear. Uh, so when we went to the plastic company to make different things about this, you know, they were all so happy to see me walking out with my checkbook and say, gee, we got a shelf full of these red ones and blue ones and green ones and young. We don't want any of that crap. Everything is clear. What? Who does clear on a pinball machine? <laughs> we do. Really. So, you know, and all the things that we can blow, who is that? It's not for me, anyway. Um, so, and all the things that we did, um, there were a lot of things that we had to create. We've talked about those before. Uh, we've done updates about them before. There are still a lot of things to be discovered about the game that haven't been disclosed. Um, one of the things we were kind of waiting for for a while, for a while, for the last several months, was our uh, production play fields to come in. We were testing the finish on this because with direct ink, which is what this is now, this is like you know the cabinet guy, as I explained once before, cabinet guy cuts all the wood, it goes to the printing company, and the wood goes through the printer just like your paper that goes through your printer, and that's how it's printed. So we don't really lose any detail, and then it goes to, uh, to be coded. And uh, we found that we needed to use a DuPont product that was an automotive product that's about close to $300 a gallon. Um, and it gets cut a certain way, and there's a whole process to make this happen. But finally, uh, this past Monday, uh, you know, about, uh, I think it was about 100 play field sets arrived, and another 50 cabinets arrived, and we were really thrilled with uh, the result that we got. And, you know, people have asked me, okay, well, when are we going to get this? I'm just taking you, know, you know, whatever to do it. And I can't rush some of these things. You know, they're out of our control, uh, you know, and I'm not going to just uh, do it for the sake of doing it because somebody wants the game under their Christmas tree. You know, my hope is that we are shipping a number of games this year. We have a facility that is certainly able to produce, uh, I was told by an industry expert, up to 60 games a day. So when the guy said that to me, I said, okay, let me see one or two, you know, before we get to, you know, we're hoping to do 10 or 15 a day. And, um, you know, it's going to take us um, 20, 28 people, um, 21 and a half hours to build a game. Uh, that's the calculation um, for what we're doing. So I don't know how that relates to, um, you know, other different products. Uh, you know, I know when I took off from, uh, from Newark Airport yesterday, I looked over to the right, and I saw the beautiful Freedom Tower that's going up on uh, Ground Zero, the former site, you know, the World Trade Center, where the tragedy happened. And you know, that building didn't have the convenience, I don't know how I think of these things, the building didn't really have the convenience of being developed in secret. You know, it was out there for the whole earth to see as it went up with all its bumps and bruises and warts. And people criticized it, you know, because uh, there's a lot of emotion, of emotion attached to it, and it's a lot of money, and people said it was going to be ugly and this and that. And you know, when it's almost done rising up and reaching up, the consensus now is it's really beautiful and it's, you know, it's, it's really cool. And you know, um, we have had a really great curve on this game where a lot of the things that we showed, when I went to E3 and I went to the Seattle Pinball Show, at the time I was really thrilled to be there with something, you know, a proof of concept or whatever. As I look back at that just a few months ago, I had to be out of my mind to be there with that game. It was insane. It was, but we got nothing but, but positive came out of it. You know, Keith had his head in there with a keyboard, and we had one power supply that fell out, and this and that and everything. Yeah, it makes a good story. You know, what the heck, you know? I don't have a problem developing this product in public, uh, sharing in real time, with everybody, what's going on? If somebody had a question, if I could answer it, I answered it. If if somebody asked me, whatever it was, the best information I had at the time was what I told, and that's what I'm going to continue to do with it. So uh, let me stop for a second. If anybody has any questions, I mean, we can go kind of like uh, a little bit through that. Anybody anything? Okay. Yes. This is kind of uh, maybe just asking your opinion. Um, you know, at the price point for selling your game, it, it's kind of like talking to some people, and you know, we've seen the pictures and everything that's put out. It's kind of like the Twilight Zone of this decade, and we're you're putting out a product with a lot of toys and gadgets, and obviously an expensive 
display and right. obviously expensive programming budget. Right. But your price point really isn't different than to say a Stern LE. Okay. And but I look at a Stern LE, which is really their LE is what a pro was three years ago. You know, so really what they've done is they've you've let them you've let Stern double the price of their games. And I'm just kind of wondering how you feel about that. Um, you know, well, I don't make the I don't make the market. You know, what really happens is that the market makes its own market. So, if you know, my favorite thing to compare it to, you know, I'm a collector of Mont Blanc pens. Not to be snobby, but I, I like to write. I write people letters, believe it or not, by hand, and I like different pens. So I don't know. This one that I took with me today is one that was like six hundred dollars. I bought this in Aruba a few years ago. Now let me ask you something: Is this pen worth six hundred dollars? Well, one word answer. Not to, me. not to me. No, that is the exact right answer. Perceived value is what makes this world go round. I don't wear the cheapest shirt, but then again, I don't want to be ripped off and I don't want to pay for something that doesn't have a perceived value to me. So what happens when you have a product in any marketplace is that the ultimate judge of what something's value is, is the person that's willing to buy it. And certainly we know a million people have called me over the years and said, hey, you know, I got this game I want to sell and I need, you know, $1,800 for it. I says, okay, that's good. Do you want to buy it? No. Well, it's worth it. Yeah, but, you know, not to me. I'll give you like, you know, $1,500 for it. You know, somebody else, it might be worth two grand. So this is the, this is the magic sauce that makes the world go round. So, you know, I don't have an opinion about it because and not to be politically correct, because everybody knows that, you know, I'll just tell you what I'm thinking and let the chips fall wherever they are. Even though I'm Jersey Jack, I'm a Brooklyn Street operator. Um, you know, really, I guess what has to happen in that case, since you brought it up, is that this product has to go out into the world and find its way and be judged, even though I hate to use that word, okay? And then other products like it uh, need to be judged and then you all, as consumers, and me as a consumer and a player, need to go to an arcade or a home or wherever we want and decide, where am I going to put my money? Do I want to buy this product or do I want to buy that product? And my hope is that you want to buy all the products, because I want to see more. I don't want to see less. I'm not, a, I'm not a divider, I'm a uniter, and all that kind of stuff here, politicians say. But the truth is, you know, I'm a positive guy. My blood type, I said before, be positive. So, you know, I try to look at these things and I try to say, it is. I give blood and they told me my blood type is being positive. Does that make sense? So, you know, I try, to, I try to figure that all out. But, you know, I can't wrap my head around what the world does. You know, the sun shines out there and it's beautiful. I just had my face in the sun. But if you take a magnifying glass and you take that sun, you make a laser beam. And when that thing is focused, it can pierce right through steel. Okay? See, Ross, I worked your name into this. It could pierce right through steel, okay? So my focus, the focus of our company, is not to look at anybody else. We don't, honestly, I don't care. I don't think about it. We need to do what we need to do. Whatever you need to do, I hope you buy my game. I hope you play my game. So that's what, what I guess I'm a little worried about. Wait a minute, about. I didn't tell you to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? What's your name? I'm Clay. This is the Clay Show and Jack, so. Yeah. Well, what I'm looking at is I see a lot of value for the price point that you're at. Okay. A lot. Okay. Where I look at Stearns and I don't see that. Value. Okay, well go to a Stern seminar. Well, no, no, that the question? point I'm making is, is that they've been doing it over and over. Right. So they're obviously making money. Okay. I'm worried about you. Exactly. What happened? I'm worried about you. Don't worry about me. But we I'm get out all the money we want. That's not a problem. Just, My biggest problem was proving that we could do a game. You know what's going to happen with money now in my company? I got people, I got VCs that are friends of mine that want to put billions, millions of dollars into my company right now. They want a piece. Everybody wants 10%, 8%, 12%, but I don't want the money. If I build 15 games a week, a day, sorry, I got a nice little company. We could have Mercedes Benz or we could have Rolls Royce. I didn't start this thing to make money. I was fine. But you didn't start it to lose money either. Okay, well, you know what? Guess what? That thing sitting right there was more than $2 million to me. Show me in my industry, and I've asked industry experts that are in the business more than me, when the last time in my industry that a real company started, got up off the mat and started, and spent $2.5 million creating a product. 
I don't know when. It probably was Sega in the 1970s or 80s or something when they had 500 people working on a video game, maybe. I don't know when that was. And I'm not saying we did something great. I'm not here crowing and tooting my horn. What are you I'm making a statement of fact as an industry, industry observer. This is going to be a game two. Yeah, the game two, I know what game two is. I know what game three is. You reminded me, you know, when, when I was going out with my wife and um, we got engaged, you know, people said, well, when do you get married? And then you get married and they said, well, when do you have a kid? And then you had a kid and they said, well, when do you have a second kid? And then, you know, that's what you just asked me. You know, let me, let me breathe a little bit. Let me get this game going out the building. You know, because now game two doesn't have to cost us $2 million to develop. Guess what? You know, we licensed Bally Midway parts. Bally Williams parts, sorry. I was thinking Bally Midway, this one connected thing, because it was. I thought I was getting this library of unbelievable <laughs> stuff. I thought they were, you know, drawings and schematics and everything. There was nothing there. There was nothing there. There was, there was some kind of piece of paper that if you went to the vendor that was still in business when they made that part, Technical difficulty. <laughs> okay. You know, I'm great as a pinball guy. There's a microphone guy. <laughs> keep, keep your day job, okay? Remember that. So, you know, as uh, can you hear me now? I know what you're doing. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, as, a, as, as licensing those things, we thought we were taking a shortcut. And it was a great thing because we, we were able to use patents and different things like that that maybe we couldn't do. Plus, if I told you in the beginning, well, what kind of parts are you using? Well, I don't know. We're using some kind of fugazing thing that we're going to make up for whatever. So, you know, look, I'm a service guy. I don't want to put more parts in the toolbox. If I told you we're using Williams parts, you know, that are familiar to you, it was a great thing. Joe Walser and, and Brian and a couple of our mechanical guys, they kind of redraw everything from tilt mechanism <coughs> to flippers, to everything. Because everything got a little tweaked, and they became somewhat proprietary to us. So if a target maybe was at five degrees, we made it at four degrees. So a lot of things we improved. And guess what? That's our intellectual property now. You know, a lot of it. patents we don't have. And Rick, we have a multi-year, a multi-game agreement. And I'm thrilled with him, he's a great guy. Other things you look at in the game that we had to do like that, it was everything. It was, it was reinventing everything. So um, that was part of the development, what it cost to do this. Game number two, I don't have, guess what? I don't have two and a half million dollars into the game. Do I lower the price of the game? No, I'm probably gonna get my behind kicked for building the first thousand games and then after game number a thousand. So look, if it was two and a half million dollars, let's say you're all economic majors, and you put, you amortize the two and a half million dollars into the first thousand games, guess what? That's $2,500 a game built into the building materials of this game. Some people, if they saw the bone materials to this game, they need a body bag next to the game, so they die. Okay? <laughs> the RGB LEDs in the game alone are more than $500 just in parts. Who does that? A crazy guy. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, I don't want to say I'm crazy. <laughs> However, uh, somebody gave me the shirt. Now, Johnny Norman, Johnny Norman, stand up. Stand up. This guy, God bless you, he had a stroke and he couldn't walk. Okay? And his picture's been on my desk and I've been praying for this guy. And since March, he walks, man. He's, he's like. Right? Yeah. This was your thing, yeah. right? And this was your motivation to get better and to walk. Uh -huh. All through your therapy and everything else. You right? give me that shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I will proudly cherish that. I'm going to put it in the frame and hang it on my wall with the 10,000 other things everybody gives me that I don't need. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody gave me a, a ceramic jug last time that's on my desk and all kinds of other things. Please, you know, uh, it's, it's, I got enough junk. But did that play? Did that do it for you? And I well, I, I just, I'm doing the math that it's not adding up and it just gets me worried. You know what I mean? Like you said, $500 in displays yeah. and, you know, $300 worth of, or $200 a gallon worth of clear coat for the plate. You know, you just keep adding that up and yeah. it's like, 
Just it's say a lot of money. You. It's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot of money. I mean, it's a lot of money. In the you know, look, when I started the thing, I didn't know what we were building. That's the other problem. You know, look, if you had a formula of what it was, I could have told you like a year and a half ago what the building materials were. But until they finished, I didn't really know what the building materials were. You know, it, it was near where I guessed it would be. Because I looked at other uh, things that were being done. And then I added my percentage of what I wanted to do. This game really, the problem with this game is that, if there's a problem, and I put it in quotes, this is exactly what happens when you hire the absolute best people that you can get and that are motivated and positive and that have a passion, and you leave them alone. You say, go do whatever you want to do. Go do whatever you want to do. I don't really care what you want to do, in fact. Just go do it. It don't take forever, but, you know, do it. So that's what happened. That's what happened. And you know, I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of them. I'm very proud of the people that um, uh, you know decided to be a part of it. You know, when there was just Dennis Norman making a paper house with a piece of wine on the table, and that sold another hundred games. You know, because the guy made a paper dollhouse, and I was, and I thought that was cool. I look back at some of those things, and I, I look at it now, and it seems, you know, it seems um, special in a way, but it kind of seems. Uh, Silly or crazy? Or, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, look, it, it's it's part of what we did, how we did it. You know, I have business writers from. I have a friend of mine who works at the Wall Street Journal who wants to do a story on us. His story is not focused so much on pinball. His story is focused more on. Let me ask you something, Jack. We're we're in bad economic times, right? You got what? You got like a thousand people to give you money for something that they didn't see or they didn't play or whatever. Well, I said, yeah, but. You know, pinball is something that trademark saying pinballsales.com is we sell everything nobody needs. So it's a pinball machine. You guys invested in uh, the future of what you believe pinball to be, and you bought a game. You know, and you'll get your game. And uh, hopefully you buy game two and three and four and five. And hopefully what we're trying to do, we're trying to get these young people to see this game on a location, on a commercial location. Dave and Buster's, Chuck E. Cheese, all kinds of movie theaters all over. Places like that, amusement parks, okay? And they walk and they walk over to it, or they see it from a distance, and they see what's going on there. And to them it's really cool. Because they have all the electronic gadgets, they have more stuff than we ever had. When I was a kid, you play with a pot in the pan and bang it against the walls. <laughs> <laughs> now you know everybody's got if, if this kid I bet he's got an iPhone, this kid. You know, so uh, yeah. if, if they don't have that stuff, you've got to overstimulate people today. You know, we're spoiled. We're really spoiled. I know that. Um, so I figured, look, let's do it with all the senses, sensory overload. So really cool sound system, 2.1 audio, you know, the, uh, the uh, HD LCD in the back box with all the animations that we had done, the RGB lighting, the striking cabinet art, all the mechanical toys that are on there because I wanted to stay traditional. I didn't want to be completely radical where you know you just take a play field and you make it an electronic thing. You know, where best love elements of this movie, you know, with the flying monkey that you'll see fly down, you grab the ball and bring it up to the witch's castle, lock it in there, and the spinning house and it lands. And then the witch of the east, her feet come out of the house, and you have the throne room, and you have the witch that you melt, and she's the villain, the two magnets over there. I don't want to spoil it for you. You guys can play it later. <laughs> I don't want to spoil it for you. You guys play it later, and I'll be standing around next to it. And you know, if you think it's it's good, you know, tell me. And if you think you know there's something about it that you want to see or an explanation or whatever, I'll I'll be happy to explain it to you. You know, and that's. That's our first game. And you know, if that's our first game, I'll probably be standing here at some point in the future and I'll say to you, well, I'll take this sheet off and it'll be our second game. And I'll say, remember when I was here with Wizard of Oz and I said how great that was? Well, now we figured out a way to make it even greater, okay? Because we're not going to take that money and just put it in our pockets. We're going to use that money to innovate and create and keep going. Our guys are already working on things for game two. And that they're crazy because they like to jack, they like to outjack me, I call it. Because if I want to surprise them with something, what they do is they say, hey, you got a minute? Come into my uh, whatever. And, and I go in there and they wow me with something. I'm like, this is crazy. These guys are nuts. You know? so, how about another question? Yes, sir. Uh, those of us who uh, put an order in for the uh, first game, 
Yes. Uh, will we get any uh, priority position in in? So what will happen game? is, you know, I'm not going to announce what our second game is before our first game should be, because I don't think that's a really good idea. You know? <laughs> Although there's people that actually just want to give me money now for a game to be determined later, which I don't want. You know, we don't want the money. So when you get your game and you got number six eighteen, there'll be an order form in there, and it'll tell you what's going on, and you'll be there'll be a whole payment structure there. And there's actually a set date that we have that we know we're going to release that game. So you'll actually know when it's going to be released and, and what it is, because we'll be in a position to say that on game number two, you know, where we couldn't really on game number one hammer it down. Yes? Somebody else? Yes? Do you see eventually economy of scale where maybe these wonderful games can be more like $4,000? I've got a lot of friends that think this is all cool, but they just go, what, 6,500 or more? Yeah. And they just can't justify Wait till it. I know. Sold on the I'm market. But with, if you uh, I, don't, I don't know how to do that without taking half box. the game out of the game. Yeah. So if game I took out game. everything that makes the game really cool, I could do that and well, that, I can. Yeah, but as you ramp up in game three and four, you don't see it that way then? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. You know what? I, I, I want to keep things. You know, there's a tradition in my industry. There's a guy in Florida that has a manufacturing company that builds redemption games. And when his game makes money, the first thing he does is he raises the price by about $1,000. For no reason, just because he can. Okay? I'm not going to do that stuff. I never liked that stuff. I never liked what happened to me as an operator or a distributor. And I remember all that stuff. I don't forget where it came from. So, you know, if there's a way to do it, yes. Maybe as time goes on, these RGB LEDs that we're using are going to come down, and maybe the cost base of it will be $250 instead of $500. Will we be in a position to pass that along or keep the $250 and say, nah, 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 nah. I don't know. You know, probably, you know I'm, I'm probably, you know, I have more of a conscience about that. You know, for operators, we have proven that um, price is not <laughs> an object to buying a really great game that makes money. So it goes back to more home customers. Okay, so again, it comes down to the fact, well, maybe I don't have room for this game, but I'll sell two games because, look, used pinball machine values have gone up, and I don't want to know play why that happened. Because okay. <laughs> well, that happened. Exactly why that happened. That happened related to your first question. Exactly. I know that. But let's not go there. So anyway, I agree with you. I understand that. I'm not, so, um, you know, you sell two games and buy one of these. You know, I don't know. That's what I would do. Yes? You mentioned that uh, some may ship by the end of the year. My, just my general question is between part sourcing, cabinets, play field software, if whatever your 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 company sharing, what what are kind of some of the big the, the remaining items that you guys are? Uh, we're waiting for um, uh, production um, uh, circuit boards right now because the boards in the game were designed by our people, so they're proprietary to us. It's not like we went to a board house and had somebody like just design something. So, you know, those go through different revisions and testing and tweaking and all that kind of stuff. So, those are a few weeks out. Those are probably around that drive around Halloween. But that doesn't prevent you from building games. You know, so you build what you build and you plug in boards and you do what you do. You know, there's a lot of things that would happen in buildings that just go on. You know, you gotta, you got to put together, you know, uh, thousands of assemblies. And you, you got to do all kinds of there's, there's plenty of work to do. There's plenty of people doing stuff like that. Yes. Uh, Jack, can you tell us the difference between what we're seeing here and what we're going to see and what you showed us up in uh, yeah. Seattle? Yeah. So really, um, you know, if you go to the camera, I don't know if you can make that brighter or whatever, or you put a light, put a light up a little bit brighter. Oh yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, so when you look at the game in this area here, there's a design element that's not there. There's um, there's a fence that goes under there because I didn't want to see the wood on that front of that play field by this, by this rainbow. Um, the game itself, you know, physically is is, is all there pretty much. Um, some of the other, yeah, I think you got to turn it up. When you play it inside, come to me, I'll explain it to you. But part of the other thing is that um, some of the lights on here that aren't on, some of the signs that work in the programming. I don't know what Keith's percentage of the programming right now is, because he had to build a whole back end of it. And there's a whole test system in here. So if I, um, you know, I took the key out. Last night I pulled the fuse, took the key out, 
And somebody still got into the room to take a picture to enter the Facebook contest of, uh, of taking a picture. So, you know, even when I go in there, you know, our, um, all the back end kind of stuff that happened with this for uh, testing, and you know, Martin, uh, you're gonna get you're gonna get access later. You don't have to knock yourself out right now. Stand down. Just cool your jets. So you know, when you when you do this, you're gonna see stuff like that. You're gonna there's gonna be actually tutorials in here how to fix the game. Of course, the game is broken. That's not gonna help you. So of course, there's still gonna be a printed manual. Uh, we have an uh, electrical engineer, somebody in Pinwall, uh, doing the manual because he's very, very picky uh, about how the manual is. Butch Peel, who I announced in Texas, that's going to be our on, on the road kind of guy. Uh, he's involved in writing the manual with a couple of other people, including me. Uh, been in there. It's, it's, it, I got to tell you, it's been a lot of fun for me too because I'm actually on the line putting stuff together. Whether it's hammering T nuts in, or um, uh, you know, on a ball guy fixture, or or doing other stuff, then it's it's kind of cool. Um, I didn't really expect that, but it's a lot of fun. Um, so really, you know, the stuff that Keith's involved with is pretty much everything. And I say to Keith sometimes, uh, I don't say it to him anymore. You need help? No, I think I'm doing pretty good. And you know, he'll he'll work. He was in our building last week doing some stuff and. Uh, these programmers are something else. If anybody has a program or knows one, you know there's no hours for those guys, and they work relentlessly. And he's, if I had to choose one person on planet Earth to do anything with our games and programming, and I got the right guy, Keith Johnson, because he's unbelievable passion, unbelievable talent, unbelievable guy, really great person. So uh, really happy. Um, so going back to this, there's not a lot to answer your question. There's not really a lot. You know, you're talking uh, software right now uh, to make it to make it be what we're going to make it. You know, you have I don't know 500 different kind of speech things going on and sound. Like Chris Brown is finally going to get together. Not finally, but he's getting together with Keith to do the iterations to play speech and things like that. Because right now, some of it's thrown around that it's not. And again, this is what happens when we see sausage made. You know, so. Uh, that famous thing where, you know, you guys are getting to see behind the scenes and you deserve to do that. You know, mostly with the product, you get to watch how it's made and they give you a little thing on how it was made. But they didn't tell you all of the how it was made. They tell you how they want to tell you how it was made. I'm telling you how it was really made. You know, so that's what we're going to do. Um, <coughs> so we got any other questions? So, yes? What about the crystal ball? Can you tell us anything new about that? Yep, it's it's gonna it's gonna do something. Like they're working on something. <laughs> <laughs> it's, gonna, it's gonna do something. They're working on some kind of late show with it. That's that's still uh, not concocted yet. That, that's a good point. That one's that's not done yet. But but by I have to by the amusement park uh, show they tell me that's gonna be done. So you know, I, I some some nights I, I lay up at night and I think about munchkins and crystal balls. And, <laughs> I don't know if that's normal for like the 50 year old <laughs> Really? These munchkins are giving me trouble. <laughs> yes? Anybody? Yes? No. You're shy? Question? Uh, no? Okay. No, we got one over here, Jeff. Yes. Yeah. Um, you have a 1,000 limited edition animals yeah. that you run. Are yeah. future games going to have that 1,000 limited edition? Um, Game two that we're doing lends itself to do that. I don't really believe in doing everything as a limited edition. You know, I know I was partially guilty for some of that years ago in, in, in bringing that along, and I, I saw some reason to do that on certain games because they, you know, we had the collectors that wanted to buy it. But you know, what we did was really kind of simple, where it's only there's there's not this huge chasm between the two. So, um, you know, we had one school of thought that said, well, there's not enough there to differentiate it, but the other school of thought is, well, I got my money's worth, and plus, you know, I got a limited game, and I feel, you know, I got one of the thousand of the first game that this company made, and, you know, so it has a collectible value, uh, you know, perceived collectible value, I should say. So, <laughs> we don't know that yet. We'll find out. If, if you do go that route. You know, we have 414. Are we going to have yes, first pick? Yes, that's what I was going back to say before. You know, we'll get first pick on the number. Yeah. On the and the game. limited edition. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Jack, you said that uh, you, know, you don't want to tell us what number two is. 
but maybe you could give us a little seed on life and sources of my life. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> yes. Come on. Uh -huh. Jack, when do you see games going out on test location? Uh, yeah. When I think they're ready, which is which is probably you know the best answer that I should have said a long, long time ago. I'm learning as I go along, but you know I I think it's 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 within a couple of weeks or something like that because uh, I see what's going on and uh, where I want it to be when it goes out because you know you want it to get its best chance. You know uh, we have you know an amazing location to test the first one. And it's a very competitive arcade. And if the game makes money there, other pinball machines are in that arcade, I know what they make. So if it goes in there and it makes what I want it to make, and that's the beginning of it, then I know we got something. If it goes in there and it doesn't make any money, then I have a different problem. Thank you. Might there be a test location in California? There might be. I got, you know, I hear from a lot of people around the country. And uh, there, might, there might be. You know, we're probably going to keep the first ones close to home because we don't want them. Uh, we, we don't want them to be. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I can come over. Yes. So I, I know the, the balloon pop-up room. Right. About the stand-up. Right. Probably. Right. Kind of wall setting or something. Right. Wall, that's everyone's guess. On the right side, it says total escape. Mm -hmm. It would be a good thing because total got away. But but it's a ball drain. He's got an amazing uh, uh, rule set, you know, and, and you know it's it, it's very cool. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. It's very deep, and uh, it's what you'd expect from one of his games. And he hasn't been he has not been told by me that on a certain date he's done. You know, I don't care if, if we got game four and he wants to add more stuff to this game. He can. You know, he can he can go absolutely completely out of his mind. And a lot of what he's done, it's almost like, uh, I tried to understand this because I don't understand how it works, but it's kind of like prepping a room for paint, you know, where he got to now. And now painting the room is not as difficult as the prep uh, in a lot of ways. So a lot of the elements uh, coming together, this is not the latest software. This was the latest software, you know, as of like last Saturday. You know, I'm certain by now, you know, the games that are playing in Jersey got all this stuff going on, and Keith's game at home's got other stuff going on, and this and that. You know, it's literally, you know, when he was in our building doing stuff, it's literally, you know, I could see stuff this morning and then I could see stuff this afternoon. So remember again what I was saying before, when the program a program, when Keith programmed, you know, the Simpsons, let's say, you know, he had lights, but he didn't have to decide all the colors they were going to be and make all of that be. He didn't have all the animations. He didn't have the depth of speech calls, let's say. So he's got, you know, somebody wrote an odd group this morning. I don't envy the work that Keith has to do. He needs that stuff up. I mean, that's what he lives for. That's that's what he. That's his DNA. He loves this thing. Yeah. How easy is it going to be to update the software? Uh, very easy. Can you email it to you? Email it to you. USB. Yeah. There's no patent on that or anything either. You could. The, the game will be able to do it over the internet. Yes. What's your percentage of operator-based sales to old? So I think right now on, on the limited, you know, maybe there's about uh, there's about 40 or 45 games, something like that, because we had to count up how many bill acceptors we had to order for those people. Because every operator that bought one of our games, we're giving them a bill acceptor free on their first game, Mars bill acceptor. Actually, the other day, we replaced an order with Mars to figure out how many we actually needed. So really, it's a very small percentage. Of well, operators are not going to. I'm an operator. You know what? Show me. Where right, well, show me. Get you know, back to this question. Is. You said you have this expectation in the arcades that you wanted to make this much. Does that really matter at this point? point? I mean. Oh, money matters. Are you kidding? That's what drives uh, an operator. No, but what I mean, but your operator percentage is so small compared to collector. Percentage. So if I have a friend of mine that operates 300 movie theaters and he takes one and it makes money, you know what's going to happen? Next year, two Wizard of Oz movies come out. You know what he's going to say to me? Send me 300 games. That's what that's what I would say. You'll read about it and replay. That's what's going to happen. All it's got to do is work and make money. Two simple things. Two simple things.
got to work. I know how the game's built. I'm an electronics technician. I fixed thousands of pinball machines for 37 years. Guess what? <coughs> you think the game's going to work? Yeah. Okay. I designed games that made all kinds of money. I designed a Wizard of Oz pusher at a company I was partners in two years ago. Russell still works for them. The game's doing five grand a day. Okay, Wizard of Oz pusher. People in the group were saying, oh, the artwork is ugly. Guess what? It's an amazingly fun game. Every arcade, every day of a buster should go out and buy one today, those guys. They should get their nickels together and buy the thing to throw out all the junk they're buying. They should go buy those games. That's what I want to build. I want to build fun things that relate to everybody that are just cool. You know, and make operators money. If operators don't get good food, if they don't have good games, they can't make money. And if they can't make money, they can't stay in business. And you can't go to their arcade and play games. I'm an operator, I understand what it is. I get I get I, 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 when I talk about game operators. like Twilight Zone that when it came out. Okay, it, so it, here's it, what happened with Twilight Zone. We gotta go into the history book. We gotta go into the history book. So let's go to the history book. Pat really Lawler, a good friend of mine who were renting this building in Harvard, Illinois, okay? He did Adam's family. It sold wildly. And all the generate all the geniuses in this suit said, you know what? Let the guy do anything he wants to do. And they let him do anything he wanted to do. And Pat is amazing. Amazing design, okay? To me, a spectacular game. But you know what? It was too complicated. It was too hard. It was a, it was a failure on the round because it was too frustrating for somebody to play. But now it became a collectible but because all of us geeks can't beat the thing, so every one of us has to have a Twilight Zone in our collection. Right, and that's the point I was This game's not hard to play. This game's an easy game to play. This game's a real easy game to play. We took the scores down, too. You don't shoot the ball and get 100 million you get rewarded like in Meet the Fockers for ninth place, you get a trophy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're you're going to get 10 points, one point. I told you guys, one of my favorite games in my basement is Buckaroo. When I get that 1,000 point thing to light up, I thought, like, you know, like the, the wow, fireworks are going to go off. I, I, I played my guts out to make that happen. Okay, so we want to have some kind of achievement, some kind of relevancy. Okay, of what the score is. 1939 movie, classic. The score is down. I don't know if we're going to do that with every game. Maybe, probably. We'll see how it works. You know, it's been very, very well received. But you know, we get people coming to our building, kids playing games. You know, the Swisher guy brings his kids, and this one, that one. We get outsiders that don't know anything, that didn't see anything, and they come and they're like, "Wow, can I play this game? This is really cool." What do you mean? Uh, could you tell I'm from Brooklyn, by the way? <laughs> so that was one of the design elements I wanted. I wanted a little game behind the game. And, you know, I know how to play pinball, so... I get into, can you see this thing going on here? I don't know if you can actually tell straight. Um, you can't really see the house, and you can't really see, uh, all right. So I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll see if we get, um, let me get on this side. What? No, 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 no. Oh, you can see the house? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you lock the first wall, 
Now the, mon now the monkey's flying down, grabbing the ball, bringing it up to the witch's castle. It's not on the screen. I know, that's why, it's, that's why I said you got one camera. Right in one place. You guys got to play it. It's, it's, it's very, again, it's a hard game to translate to uh, a video. everybody a chance to play. I mean, you guys uh, are not going to get into like a whole, uh, a whole thing going on. And we have it set right now so that you can see the GIs, you know, these uh, general illumination lights. Um, and we have them, we just have them uh, going through colors right now so you get a little bit of an idea how they're going to look. Um, but obviously, you know, when it's going, uh, you got different things going on on the play field lighting-wise and feature-wise. Um, Two magnets under the witch. So when you hit her, she's gonna be up. She plays around with the ball. You know, makes it do a lot of life because um, you know, it's um, I'm pretty proud of what they did. I'm really happy with what they're gonna give me now. Hey Jeff. I like it. Is there a way to modify some of the video? Uh, Hang on a minute. Let me let me uh Okay. Is there a way to bypass some of the video? You know, by hitting flipper or something? Yeah, it'll be that way. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, uh, we're all players, and sometimes you don't want that in there, right? Maybe it slows the game down or something like that. But, you know, the however is if, if the monkey is taking your ball, you know, nothing to do but watch the screen anyway. You know? So there's going to be certain elements and times where, you know, I like a flow game, I like a stop and go game. We all have collections, so we all have different games in the collection. So, you know, it's hard to, again, go back to the beginning and be that everything to everybody because, you know, we're not going to, some people are not going to like the theme, believe it or not, but they're going to like the game. You know, there's games inside that have no theme that I really like because they have certain elements of them. So I never really met a pinball machine that I, that I hated because if you like pinball, you're not going to hate anything. So, yes? How did you come up with the Wizard of Oz theme as opposed to something else? So the famous story about the Wizard of Oz theme is Drew Maniscalco, who works for us, is a great guy. He worked for a lot of companies over the years in the industry. Um, when I was thinking about starting a pinball company, and that goes back to about, um, I guess it was, it probably was at Expo in 2010, really? when I was really seriously thinking about that. And um, yeah. I asked him to find out what licenses were available. And he got in touch with Warner Brothers, and they had a whole list of really cool stuff. And I said to him, you know, get, get me the Wizard of Oz. And he, his comment, his famous comment was, really? <laughs> so, you know, that was the overwhelming, happy response to one of the questions. And that's a guy that does licensing. Yes? Can you speak about, like, uh, with the internet connectivity versus how it might tie in with, like, multiplayer play, possibly? We can do anything possible. Yeah, I mean, it's not Dick Tracy stuff. You know, you have a computer in there, you have an off the shelf motherboard uh, in there that, that has uh, um, USB, wireless USB. And, uh, you know, anything you can do on the internet, potentially and, and practically, you can do this. I and mean, we have people working on some of that stuff now to, to make that to make that happen. You won't see it today. You might see that revealed with other shows and things like that. But yeah, it's all it's all in the mix. You got to do that. You, uh, I think I think you got to do that. Maybe I'm wrong. 
Yes. Don't you think that could actually go a long way to like authenticating like uh, scoring or like top scorers? And yeah, players? and you know, Martin had some good ideas along those lines too about how many players a game could be and how it could be set and different things like that. And you know, we can put we can put um, we can put devices in the game to make sure that the glass is actually on the game and not just playing the game by hand. Uh, that's, and, and I'm not talking about switches, we're talking about different electronic sensing devices that we can tell a level of sound in the game. So it's, it's a certain level, believe it or not, that we know the glass is on the game. So it's some crazy stuff that these guys come up with, but it's not, it's not like Dick Tracy wristwatch radio stuff. Yes? So the, uh, the, the playful doesn't really show if you took the listeners for like mode, because of course there might be something on that. The LCD, but is it going to be a mode-based game? Is it going to have a typical Keith epic yes. mode? Yes. Like super yes. Mode, yes. Super yes. Yes. Okay. yes. I wish Keith was here. He didn't want to come with me. He's too busy coding the game. So he didn't want to come. Do you know how many modes there'll be about? A lot. A lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> That's the number I was told. I like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Of it. Yes. Would you say this is a three ball or a five ball? No, it's game. five ball game. It's five balls. It's five ball game. Oh, you mean when you're talking about play? Well, or you I mean, walk up to it in an arcade and play three balls or five balls? Yeah. So obviously we give an operator every option that's possible. You know, we, you know, after we test it and actually see if the thing does make money, uh, we'll give our opinion, my opinion, of what you should set it out as an operator and what you should charge for it and to maximize your earnings. What you do with it, you know, hopefully nobody puts it out of the quarter. Yes. What language is the program written in? Are you going to open source code? No. Um, we're going we're gonna to do something when we do a generic, when we do a non licensed game. We can't do it on a licensed game because, you know, you don't want it. We can't, just can't do it. You know, there is a plan um, to do something along the line of what I said uh, when I first thought of this. So uh, it could happen. I never say never. It could happen. There's some people in the company battling against it, though, and some people uh, believing in it, including me. So we'll see what happens as we go along. But it's definitely something that we're uh, possible. How many are shipping to Europe? A lot. Half? More than half? Huh? Half? No, no, not half. We, we, I tell you what, you know, uh, I haven't really tried to get a lot of international distributors because uh, I want them to have a game. So, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of those people and they're all very excited and you know what they want to do? They want to see it. They want to see it. They want to play it. They want to know what it is. And I think when they see it and they play it and they know what it is, they'll make some huge commitments to, uh, to take games. <clears throat> you know, and that's what, that's what basically every single one of them told me. So, you know, I mean, just prove it. Show, show me what you got, and show me it works, and show me <coughs> that it makes money, and, you know, I'm, I'm there. Yes? Um, I have two lighting questions. Can the topper change color? Uh, this one can't, no. But what? the Yeah, uh, this one won't. It's green. Okay. This is the animal set. And behind the, the logo on the back glass, is that going to have any kind of lighting effects, or is that just going to be a single? Behind the load, no, it's going to be just that right now. It could be. We, we, you know, there's, uh, you can kind of see through it. I mean, there's a, uh, there's a strip of uh, LEDs there. So we, it could be. You know, we could put a strip of, in a different game, you know, uh, RGB LEDs and, you know, make light shows and everything. I think I gave him enough to do right now without trying to invent more this stuff from the do that he can't get to. So. When he's got nothing to do, that's, what, that's the things that these guys think of. It's like what you were talking about. Like, how can we add more to this thing? You know, and I'm like, how can we finish this thing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, you know. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. Well, welcome to manufacturing. Uh, that's what it always is. Anybody else want anything? All right, so I think kind of like this is the point of the, of the thing where like, I throw t-shirts to everybody. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you got pizza in there too? Because it's kind of lunchtime. <laughs> yeah.
I don't know, you know, like, so how about the kids first? You got, like, some of these uh, small size kids? I don't want to just get everybody to come up like, on my screen. What's your sense? Watch it. Do you think it's sleep? <laughs> distribute them somehow. I don't know if there's enough for everybody. Maybe just they have to come up and fight over them somewhere. <laughs> we never got a t-shirt from us. We never got a t-shirt. We never got a t-shirt from us. Oh, yeah, get a shirt. I don't want to spend it like an hour doing this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, get them. Go ahead. What, what size is it? XL. I've been reduced to being uh, a popular of the red. XL. XL right here. I thought uh, this is my good of all these two. I'm doing such a silly thing. I don't know why I started this thing. <laughs> no, not the company, the t shirt. Two <laughs> XL. Okay, I got in the back. Thank you. 